What are these two unknowns, photographed in deep space by astronauts Lovell and Borman? What are they? Where do they come from? Are they secret devices created by world governments? Are they manned or unmanned, or both? If they are manned, are they manned by extraterrestrials? Why are they here? What attracts them to our planet? Are they friendly or hostile? How long have they been coming here? What is their energy source? What can account for impossible right angle turns which violate all known laws of aerodynamics? Why do world governments continue to deny their existence when photos like these continue to appear in newspapers the world over? I've had 315 transmissions, none of them personal. Helpful messages of different kind are given. The voice of Dr. George King, president of the Ethereum Society. There is not one single important question facing the world today that has not been answered by the space people in that 315 message transmission. They have not condemned man, but they have made various suggestions how man can help himself to stop wars, to cure all disease, to cure all famine on Earth. We've even had intimations on how desert regions could be cultivated, etc., etc., etc. One person I met was tall, round about seven foot. He had Two eyes, nose, mouth, two legs. Skin was a cinnamon color, as though that skin had been tanned by exposure to long or even shortwave ultraviolet light radiation. This Earth, indeed this solar system, has been invaded several times in the past 20 years. Those invasion attempts were aborted because the five adepts, as we call them, fought on your behalf. You would have been utterly, abstractly powerless against the forces which did not have your interest at heart. Recorded April 1978 at the Shrine Exhibition Hall in Los Angeles, California.
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the water let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place let the dry land be. and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called the seas, and God saw that it was good. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin lift off on man's first attempt to land on the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. as mankind joined in anxious anticipation for the first television transmission from the moon. But what of the poverty-stricken masses, the third world, the hungry, the dying? What would this giant leap mean to them, if anything?
Dr. Frank Strangis, director for 14 years of the National Investigations Committee on UFOs. New sciences and industries appear as man probes further and further. The moon is only a stepping stone to other planets, other galaxies. The government is pushing to gather UFO data, confirms Apollo astronaut Edgar Mitchell, who landed on the moon in 1971. Interest in UFOs has been revived and is increasing at all levels in the military, says Mitchell. There have been just too many UFO sightings and too many fighters scramble to chase them. of spacecraft with new energy sources from atomic power to solar propulsion designed to travel in space for years Man's imagination knows no bounds as he reaches out to make contact with outer space beings. But man must also prepare himself physically and mentally. He must devise protective clothing against hostile space environments. Are there beings in outer space, extraterrestrials? Do they communicate from planet to planet, from spacecraft to spacecraft? Are they trying to contact Earth physically as well as psychically? Man listens scanning the depths of space in search of decipherable sounds which he can in turn translate into meaningful messages. These are two unidentified flying objects photographed by United States astronauts as they were making history on the fringes of outer space. 
These are two elongated UFOs that were photographed trailing U.S. astronauts on their way to the moon. According to a high-ranking officer at Cape Kennedy, not one space probe leaves the launching pad without being trailed by unidentified objects, as is attested to by these two unknowns photographed by Lovell and Borman. UFOs have been photographed by people from all walks of life. This particular one was taken by Dr. Daniel Fry, scientist. Sighted at night, these three unidentifieds were photographed in the skies above Honolulu, Hawaii, by a housewife. Notice the close formation of this 180-degree turn, which has mystified aerodynamic experts the world over. These four UFOs were photographed by seaman Shell Alpert over the Coast Guard base at Salem, Massachusetts. The UFOs made no sound and were not tracked by radar. This UFO was photographed over the home of an insurance executive in Seattle, Washington. Paul Villa always had a secret ambition to see and photograph a UFO. This day in 1965, he was in the right place at the right time with a camera. According to the experts, Paul photographed an instrument package or space probe, very similar to the probes that have been launched from Cape Kennedy to the moon, Mars and Venus. According to Paul, the space probe made no sound, nor did it land. This UFO was photographed by a surgeon in Adelaide, New South Wales. This is the first UFO of this type ever photographed in Australia. It was taken in 1962. This is a blow-up of this most unusual top-shaped object. Notice the metallic color. This cigar-shaped UFO was photographed above a small park in the Glendale section of New York in 1967, which was a peak year for UFO sightings in the United States. There are rare occasions when UFOs are photographed in formation. These five unknowns were seen on the outskirts of London, England. Among many witnesses present were three Royal Air Force pilots. Now this one, unlike many of the UFO sightings, gave off a high-pitched whining sound above Tulsa, Oklahoma, about one o'clock in the morning. Many witnesses were frightened, and some petrified with their mouths open. As it departed, the whine changed to a high screeching pitch, sending dogs scurrying for cover. The more it increased in velocity, the wider it became. This is an unmanned probe photographed by Paul Via on June 19, 1966, about 9 a.m., 30 miles north of Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was approximately six feet in diameter and made a loud buzzing noise. The UFO was accompanied by several spheres. When the spheres landed, they bounced shot straight up, then landed again in almost the same place. The small spheres were about three inches in diameter. The larger ones about six inches in diameter. The larger spheres remained on top or close to the top of the UFO. The rod on top of the dome is an optical device incorporating a combination of prisms and lenses. The three legs telescoped open as the craft approached the ground. Dr. King, when did you first become interested in outer space and UFOs? It was in uh, 1954, and uh, it took me by surprise, actually. Uh, I had been practicing yoga for many years previous to this, uh, but on this uh, Saturday morning in May 1954, uh, I was in my apartment and I heard a voice. Uh, it was in English. Uh, the voice was not in the head. This was no psychic apparition. Uh, the voice was outside of myself and it said, prepare yourself. You are to become the voice of interplanetary parliament. Well, I had no idea what that meant. I knew nothing about UFOs, uh, 
in those days. I had not studied them, but I had studied yoga. And I'd studied yoga long enough to realize that this was very important. And it was uh, eight days after this first event that I decided uh, that the only way that I could solve this mystery, because nobody else could help me, and I tried many people, uh, was to go into meditation myself. So I locked myself in the room, uh, fully determined to stay there until I got some answer. Well, I didn't have to stay very long because a man, physical, uh, who I did recognize, he was alive in India at the time, a well-known yogi master, he walked into the room without me having to open the door, by the way, he walked across the floor and sat down in the chair, which creaked uh, under his weight, and he told me about the previous contact I'd had, voice contact, and he gave me certain instructions. Uh, for instance, he said that you will receive uh, an invitation from a yoga teacher in uh, London, uh, and uh, you should attend his classes and so on. I have had some physical contacts as well as mental contacts. Very briefly, the mental contacts are quite unusual in a way that I precipitate a yogic somatic condition in order to gain mental rapport with higher intelligences. But I've had also some physical contacts, and I'd like to talk about one in particular. Uh, on July the 10th, 1958, uh, I was ordered by the Master of Theorius to present myself in uh, North Devonshire, uh, England, which is toward in the south of England. And uh, I went there, and I was told uh, that I must carry no metal on the body at all, uh, so I uh, parked the car in, in, in a certain place after I'd received further instructions, and I proceeded to a place called Stony Cross, which is overlooking a village called Coombe Martin uh, in Devonshire. And it was at night time, 10.30 at night. Uh, I was first contacted by a being from the planet Mars. Now, this man was invisible to me, except that he did cast a shadow in the moonlight. And his shadow was very, very much larger than mine. He said to go back to the place where we met and I would see a gap in a wall and I had to go through that gap and climb up to a hill. And I did indeed climb to uh, a hill, which later I found out to be Holston Down. Now, I was given instructions to go onto this hill and pray for world peace. Timothy Shanks, UFO researcher from San Diego, California. My research indicates to me that UFOs are physical types, there are psychic types, and there are biological types. It's a very serious subject around the world now. Who, who across the world are studying the UFOs? From the United States, we have Brad Steiger, uh, John Keel from France, we have, uh, I'm not sure he's from France, Jacques Vallée, uh, Professor Hynek, Brinsley Laporte Trench. I consider the work of uh, the late Dr. Wilhelm Reich to be very important. Uh, a man named Mead Lane, uh, some, one person from religion uh, with a religious background, Gordon Melton, is doing some interesting work in Europe. They are taking it a lot more seriously than here. Uh, the Netherlands, uh, Brazil is also, England is uh, experiencing a lot of sightings. All over the world, yes, Japan is interested. Uh, the USSR is very much interested. Venezuela, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, Norway, Sweden, the Philippines, Chile, uh, France, and uh, Grenada. Uh, all of these people uh, do officially state that flying saucers do exist, and some of them go even further and say they believe that they come from other worlds.
A country that does not believe in the existence of UFOs is a country of deep sleepers. Uh, for instance, America, uh, Russia, uh, and England have studied UFOs for a number of years, and I think they have amassed sufficient uh, information to know of their existence. But, uh, you see, they will not officially admit that they know of the existence of uh, unidentified flying objects. But how long have these UFOs been coming to Earth, and why to certain places? What have Palenque, Tiwanaka, and Stonehenge to do with these sightings? Stonehenge has been attributed to the Druids by some historians. But is this fact? How were these huge monoliths erected? Can we attribute places like these to extraterrestrials? As you check back into history, you have to remember that references to objects in the sky were not referred to as UFOs. They were described as whatever the person was viewing, whether it was a cloud or a flying boat, as North American Indians would describe some of these things, or uh, a luminescent pearl. So you have to study the language and study the account itself. But uh, all world cultures refer to various unusual objects in the sky throughout the course of recorded history. The modern era began in 1947 with the Air Force beginning its study and a tremendous number of UFO reports. Early reports of objects came in uh, 1896, 1909 from different parts of the world. Many people believe in UFOs and that extraterrestrials are coming to Earth. Some are convinced that they are now living among us. The whole town of Kerman, California, conspired to keep the May 13, 1978 occurrence a secret to preserve their privacy. However, word leaked out and made headlines. Ruth Norman of the Unaria Society discusses UFO landings and extraterrestrials from her headquarters in El Cajon, California. Greetings, Earth people. I am your space fleet coordinator. I'm the forerunner for the space people who will be landing before long now on your Earth planet. I am the messenger and a forerunner and ambassador from many of the spiritual worlds and the physical planes and the astral dimensions who have come to this your Earth planet to introduce you people to a higher way of life. Almost always uh, when people have a close proximity sighting, that is a UFO very uh, near to the road, for instance, if they're driving along in their car, the uh, car uh, engine will stop and the headlights will go out, uh, etc. This is common. Uh, it's happened all over the world. I was sitting in a car and suddenly I had my eyes closed and I was meditating. The car was filled with a brilliant blue light and I opened my eyes and there was no sound and I looked up to the sky and there was a beam of light coming down towards me and then it went out and there was nothing there. Dr. King explains his energy charging expedition requested by space beings. In Operation uh, Starlight uh, throughout the world there were 18 mountains which were charged through myself as a channel. I did not manipulate the energy for the charging of these mountains. It was manipulated through me by the space intelligences. We have here are scenes from Mount Kosciuszko in Australia, which was charged on December the 5th, 1960. We had tough blizzard conditions on that mountain. The last picture shows me manipulating the energy which was put through me by other sources, which caused an initial charge to go into this mountain. The other mountain in Australia was Mount uh, Ramshead. This was charged on December uh, the 8th, 1960, and we had no problems at all, except through heavy snowdrifts. 
These pointing stones have been there for thousands of years. The next set of uh, pictures you see were shot in Switzerland in 1961 on August the 13th, and this is Mount Medrigaflu. And again we had a blizzard conditions the day before, but it did uh, clear up considerably when we made our climb. Dr. King discusses his confrontation with a UFO that occurred in Halston Downs, England, on a hillside in the 1960s. When the Master Jesus uh, departed, uh, he moved over uh, to the side of me, and uh, it was then that I regained consciousness, and uh, because I was in a deep trance condition just before that. And uh, he, I saw a vehicle uh, somewhat similar to this one here, this model here, a, a flying saucer, a scout patrol vessel, and it came down and hovered a few feet above the earth. I'm not sure uh, how many feet, because I kind of saw the bottom of it, and uh, I saw the three little domes on the bottom, and I saw a bright green ray, very, very bright green ray, come from the bottom of the saucer like this, and Jesus stepped to one side into the ray, and he disappeared. Uh, I believe he was taken up into the craft in that way, because I saw this craft move through the heavens and join two more craft which had been hovering there during the whole experience. Uh, it's, it's an, it was an amazing happening. It, it's something which really did uh, affect me uh, very, very greatly. Brian Scott, Orange County, California, goes into a trance state, using his body as a telepathic channel to receive and transmit messages from a being known to him as Voltar. Our cameras recorded this as it actually happened. We have edited the hour-long session to show you a portion of this extremely incredulous and dangerous experiment. Counter. Call. Zero two zero zero two zero. We understand that the probe wishes to impart information at this time. We are willing to receive this information now. Acknowledge. You are being transferred, both all. Delay factor. Seven. Relay. Open. Daniel, physical energy displaced, unity, of the council, It's good to talk to you again. It is that. And of the play of life. Not today. What is now is within that knowledge. Our involvement and that of your planet. Since that of the days of Kiwanaka. And yet, but to manifest in but a few. It has been again a pleasure to share your presence. We ask the return of Brian and the amplification of all systems against secondary world interference. And thank you again for sharing this communication with us.
the deal, Lord and what what the return scar open lock. It was very strong. Are you speaking from there now? Because the eyes are rolled back. There's not a lot of their life. There was much sorrow. Danielle's decision has upset many people. How do you feel? I feel great just like it was before. There is so much to learn and so much to offer. It's nice to remember to what it was a few months ago. Wow. How about some air? <laughs> <laughs> You'll pin the needle. <laughs> what was it? You were right there at the end. Hmm. No, different. Was that the part of you that's on their world, or was that, uh, what was that? Just like it was after the transformation. Yeah. Same idea. <coughs> These Carillion Polaroid exposures were taken of Brian Scott before entering the trance state by Dr. Elan Neve. The dark exposures represent a normal energy level. The light colored photos that were taken while Brian was in trance are considered rare and unexplainable. Brian Scott remembers vividly a frightening contact with the space beings. When I was 16 years old, I experienced a phenomenon known as a ball of light that appeared behind my house. Uh, my dog basically gave the thing away by barking so loud that he was waking up half the neighborhood. Investigating what the dog was barking about, I had found this object hovering in the sky about six to eight feet above my head. The ball of light appeared to be orange-red in color and only lasted for about 10 seconds and suddenly shot up into the air. From this experience, uh, at that time, I didn't make too much of it. My most uh, important intent was to get the dog uh, to be quiet so my parents would not be aroused at 2 a.m. returning from a 16-year-old birthday party for myself. Very shortly after that, that evening, I woke up again, but this time I woke up at the kitchen table. And when I had woke up, I found myself with a big mess all over my arm. And apparently somewhere during that sleep period, I had managed to jab and tattoo this object into my right forearm, which appears to be a spider. From that time, we moved up to 1971, where I had an actually uh, physical contact with aliens uh, in the Arizona desert. It was their request at that time that I would journey to the Nazca Plains and that I would find from that the information basically to be able to bring back some of the cultural uh, studies that were going on around the Incas and so forth and the pre-Incas. Nothing about the spider when I was 16 made very much sense. In 71 it didn't make much sense either. But in 75 when we really got into all this and started taking some of the uh, journeys they requested me to do, we did find that uh, some of the stuff they were talking about was being the tie-in. And apparently it became something that I myself had eventually asked, why me? Uh, why did they particularly get into this thing with me? And I found out that it wasn't just a me situation. Apparently, to begin with, I was in the wrong place at the right time, or totally the wrong place at the wrong time. But it was based on my decision to 
to take the next step if the information they were giving me was going to be valid at all. And once we began to research and actually dig into it, myself and a few associates, uh, different various investigators and such from leading UFO organizations, we found out that the uh, relationship between the spider on my right forearm and the Nazca planes were identical. And this particular symbol ties into a technology and an energy system that is used for them to be able to travel, apparently, interstellarly between planets and stars. So what it came out to be in the very end was that the information that they were giving me was basically valid. And what they were telling me, I had some belief in what they were saying. It was from that point that I decided that if the information they could bring forth to me or through me and other people who have had an experience like this could be put together in some nutshell where we might be able to offer the information to the general public in a way where it would actually prove the phenomena as being either real or unreal, we might be able to get a handle on this UFO thing, the unknown. The unknown. The Incas, the Mayas, the Toltecs, all ancient civilizations gone from the earth. Why? What sort of unexplainable energy forces seem to be concentrated at Nazca, Tiwanaka, Palenque, Uxmal, Tikal, Chichen Itza? Brian Scott went in and out of the trans state every few seconds while he walked these planes. Why? Are these centers of past civilizations linked to forces from outer space? Facts suggest they are. Mr. Schoeffler explains the results of his encounter. A day after the encounter itself, I found that I began feeling pressure within my head, and I started seeing figures dashing out of the corner of my eye, just glimpses. And then I began to find that I could concentrate and I began to see flashing colored lights. Later I found that these, I could actually see the forms and they are what people refer to as spirits. I found also that my eyes began to change and that even in looking in the mirror I found that they began uh, to take on a more hypnotic type of stare and others related this experience to me that they had noted these changes. Dr. King discusses the origin of mankind. The planet we are now living on was uh, populated by a very advanced culture called Adamic man. Uh, hence the Adam and Eve uh, part of the Bible. Uh, the people who uh, came to this planet came from a planet called Maldek that used to orbit between uh, uh, Jupiter and Mars and there was an atomic explosion on Maldek which blew the planet to pieces. Now uh, they could not, they had to be reborn somewhere. There, uh, a reincarnation being a fact, not a theory. And also, there's no such thing as death per se. There's only death of the physical structure, but the thought and the soul and spirit do not die. So they had to have a life uh, uh, experience. Uh, so they were reborn gradually uh, throughout the hundreds of centuries onto this planet Earth. Now, all that's left of Maldek is the asteroid belt. And it's a very interesting thing to note that just lately scientists have uh, discovered uh, pieces of uh, meteors, which they know come from the asteroid belt. And some of these meteors contain uh, elements, uh, minerals, in the exact amount uh, as found in the human body. And uh, the, these minerals are petrified into the rock pieces, uh, which prove that uh, ancient man, uh, before he came to this planet, um, had a similar uh, physical structure uh, to what he has today. These unidentifieds, photographed in various parts of the world, are being monitored by many governments. 
who only secretly will attest to their existence. The theory is that to reveal the fact that governments are fully aware of UFOs and the revelation of their files would panic the public. And secondly, would cause chaos to the economy of the world. However, these are actual filmic records taken mostly by accident by people from all walks of life and in many different locations. The date, Tuesday, June the 24th, 1947. Kenneth Arnold, a deputy federal United States Marshal, took off on what he thought was to be a routine flight over the mountainous country near Mount Rainier. An experienced flyer with over 4,000 hours in his logbook, he little realized that this particular flight was to start an investigation that would cost the federal government millions of dollars. Three o'clock in the afternoon found him cruising at an altitude of 9,200 feet above the rough terrain, some distance from Mineral Washington. As was his custom, he watched the mountains below for signs of illegal campfires or other downed aircraft. But there was nothing to cause an alert. His instruments showed that he was on course and holding steady. He was making a 180 degree turn toward the forbidden plateau when it happened. A weird high frequency sound suddenly came out of nowhere, seeming to head directly toward him. Arnold banked his plane sharply, thinking he was buzzed by some new type of jet fighter. Leveling off, he tried to sight the offending jet and perhaps get a number or description to report the incident. A mid-air collision over these rugged mountains meant little chance of survival. He checked his instruments again and to make sure that he had not drifted into another flight lane, a lane used by experimental aircraft. He was still on course. Then, without warning, it happened again. Arnold pulled up sharply as the weird sound engulfed him. Only this time he saw what had buzzed him. Far to the left and toward the north, a formation of very bright objects moved through the sky in the vicinity of Mount Baker. They were flying at a fantastic speed, their silvery outlines clearly visible against the dark mountains. The strange saucer-shaped objects flew in an echelon formation and then gaining altitude shot off into the blue and vanished. Would he be a crackpot if he reported the sighting? Would he be laughed at by his superiors? But what he saw was real. There was no doubt whatever in his mind he decided to risk ridicule by making a complete report upon his return to the home base. This report, the first recognized sighting of an unidentified flying object, created a furor. Pilot Kenneth Arnold said that the silvery objects looked like flying saucers. The name made headlines throughout the civilized world. Arnold may not be remembered, but his coined phrase, flying saucers, will never be forgotten. My first encounter was in October 1958 with what I claimed to be an extraterrestrial being um, that I've since found out comes from the planet we call Saturn in our solar system. Robert Short, UFO investigator. It was, to me at the time, a very frightening experience. The being said to me, we have come down to make an adjustment in the power of our craft. We will see you at a future time. And I thought, what criteria do I have to understand it? 
And it wasn't until several years later, in fact, after another individual had a, another experience with the same individual, that I began to understand that my work as of from that time would be through the auspices of the solar government on Saturn in this system. And uh, all uh, message work that I do or channeling that I do would be through their auspices, through the subspace radio network in this system. Ruth Norman tells of Earth landings from various planets. There will be many planets, uh, 32 different planets in number. They are all physical planets, some within the solar system and some outside. Uh, 32 in number. And uh, they will all land uh, simultaneously on the Earth world. About three and a half years ago, I was inspired, uh, prompted uh, by my space brothers to purchase uh, some property uh, about uh, 40 miles north of San Diego. Uh, it's near Yamul. It's 67 acres for the spacecraft landing. Now, just one craft will land there, and we will have the other 32 craft to land at various points on the globe. Mr. Arman recounts his first experience with UFOs. I was in Los Padres National Forest in the wilderness area, and we were hunting Russian boar. And I thought I seen a, I seen a Bigfoot, and I instantly thought a million dollars, shoot it and make a million dollars, and I drew on it, and I couldn't pull the trigger of my pistol. And I tried for five minutes while it watched me. I put, it back, put the pistol back in my pocket and took off running. I was scared to death. And I went back to my friend. I told him about it, and he says, well, you must have been hallucinating. I says, okay, I was. And that night we were in the tent playing cards and uh, we just finished a hand and he was looking out the tent and he says, he says to me, he turns to me, he says, Norman, look at the funny lights up on the mountain. The mountain's about three quarters of a mile away. Three of them they got larger and larger. And then I jumped up and stood in front of the tent door and a blue one flashed across the side of the mountain. Another one came over the top and lit up about three acres. And I turned to him and I says, Joe, did you see that? And he was, had his head covered up. And I went to shake him. And he says, I'm asleep, leave me alone, leave me alone. And just then our campsite lit up as bright as day. And we blanked out. Thomas Miller on UFO propulsion systems. They do fly interstellarly. Uh, however, they do not fly in the, the same manner that uh, the rocket ships fly or blast off from Earth as we know it. They use the electromagnetic lines of force which permeate the universal substance of this galaxy. The brothers on the other planets have evolved much more rapidly than uh, the people on the Earth. And the ones that we have contacted have transmitted their messages to Earth. And uh, they have given us pertinent information of uh, instrumentations which they will help us build and construct when they do make physical contact, such as a, uh, an energy device which will use the natural oscillation of atom structures themselves. We will be taught how to arrange the vibrancy of the atoms to extract natural energy emanations from the very atom substances and siphon them off into power stations and uh, it will be a free type of energy. Mr. Schaffler reveals more about his encounters and how it affected his mind. Well, I found that I not only could see spirits, but I began to see buildings where I knew there were no buildings. I could see grids in the sky, just patterns of energy. I saw auras off of chairs, off of houses, off of literally everything I saw at nighttime just before sleep or while I was in a sound sleep that I would be woken up and I could hear as someone was talking to me as as clear as if you were talking to me now telling me that I should go to these different places for different experiences they will be landing very soon as soon as the earth man himself 
steps up his consciousness and receives the space brothers in an open receptive way where they would lay down their weaponry where they would lay down their hatreds because the space brothers bring a whole new science of life a whole new way of life which will change and restructure society as a whole and we will start to tear down the various prejudices which we have had not only among ourselves but against life on other planets life on other worlds Dr. Strangis, you have been involved with UFO investigations for over 30 years. If alien beings were to land, do you think they would be friendly? That's a good question. UFOs have uh, had this Earth under surveillance for many thousands of years, and if they were going to attack or cause the human race any problems, they would have done so a long time ago. But there have been a few cases where some cattle and some people have even suffered because of so-called negative saucers. Someone said if these are intelligent beings from outer space, they couldn't be too intelligent if they're visiting the planet Earth. But on the other hand, I believe that we have been a source of, uh, uh, shall we say, potential threat. Because as one scientist put it, we can take and set the atmosphere on fire with hydrogen devices. And this could cause the planet Earth to be completely destroyed by fire. And in so doing, it could disturb the other planets in our solar system. All the people in this solar system are friendly disposed towards Earth and they are very, very advanced uh, people, but uh, there, there are other people in other parts of, uh, well, not only this galaxy, but galaxies beyond this that have not been friendly. In fact, uh, the solar system has been uh, attacked by outside forces uh, in the last few years uh, and uh, in order to repel these forces uh, there was something which we might call a galactic war. Uh, this did happen and uh, I have uh, very detailed reports uh, in, in the Aetherius Society Library which we maintain is the largest in the world of its kind, uh, actually describing some of the action which took uh, place during this galactic war. Dr. George King in Los Angeles, 1978. There are at least three people from another planet living on Earth today. physical bodies. These three people are highly specialized adepts whose job it is to protect mankind from any interference from outer space and any invasion from outer space. The predominant UFO seems to be saucer shaped as attested to by this picture taken by Paul Villa. You are witnessing a most amazing UFO film. It was viewed by the United Nations Outer Space Affairs Committee, the Congressional Hearing Committee on UFOs, and by the government-sponsored UFO investigation conducted at the University of Colorado, where the film was also viewed by the late Dr. Werner von Braun. This 16 millimeter film was shot by Dr. Daniel Fry, a fully qualified scientist, and has been judged as a most valuable contribution to UFO authenticity. Experts have concluded that UFOs may have different planetary origins. If space beings exist, and they do travel in these space vehicles, there is nothing to prevent them from inhabiting various areas on this planet. Our egos would have to be enormous to think that we are the only intelligent beings in the universe. This picture was taken in France in 1967. It remained motionless for four minutes. These two UFOs were photographed over Tormina, Sicily. They remained silent and changed position four times before vanishing. This photograph was taken during the International Geophysical Year by an officer in the Brazilian Navy. 
These objects were seen coming out of a cigar-shaped vehicle in Morristown, New Jersey. Early one Saturday morning, Mr. George Stock was aroused by his sons shouting, there's a flying saucer above our house. This was in New Jersey. Some UFOs are motionless while others revolve. Dr. King, have any creditable writings been done on extraterrestrials and flying saucers? Uh, <clears throat> yes, indeed. <laughs> there certainly is. Uh, it's called the Holy Bible. It's one of the best flying saucer books ever written, as a matter of fact, although it wasn't written for that purpose. Uh, it's uh, filled with accounts of uh, extraterrestrial visitors and uh, bimanas and lights in the sky and flames in the sky. And uh, <clears throat> we are informed uh, by the cosmic masters that the star of Bethlehem was indeed a flying saucer. It could not have been a star because if any star had moved through the heavens and suddenly stopped uh, in the position that the star of Bethlehem did stop, this would have upset the gravitational uh, field uh, of the whole solar system. And uh, we'd have probably had a tremendous disaster, certainly on Earth, if not on other planets as well. The biggest change was that this compelling drive within to travel and go to these different places, I found myself going to Orcas Island in Washington, uh, Key West in Florida, Palenque and Chichen Itza on the Yucatan, uh, Teotihuacan in Mexico City. and each of these places, I met beings, and I say beings because they would come up to me and know who I was, not by name, but why I was there, and they had similar purposes. And we could relate, and it was as though we were contacting and joining forces and relating to each other our own experiences, and each of us had a different piece of the puzzle. Alan Michael reveals his first encounter with alien beings and discusses his visit to a UFO. The first one, I was enveloped in a shaft of light. And as I went up the shaft of light, I just looked back, saw my body and went right up out of it, right up the shaft of light, light into a mothership in outer space. This was a ship I had incarnated into this body. I was just returned to be with the people I was with before I came here in this body. There are some two million people in telepathic bodies on this planet now, making ready to receive Earth people to bring them into the kingdom of God. We interviewed Carl Anderson at the Long Beach Naval Base in California. He has been a government employee for over 20 years. He presented one of the most unusual UFO encounters on record. Space people describe how the ship was propelled. Uh, yes, they told me <clears throat> all about the propulsion of the ship. Uh, in fact, they told me that the interplanetary spacecraft are what we've come to call flying saucers. Uh, and uh, they told me that the craft was essentially a flying electrical motor. The field uh, coil turning in one direction, the uh, rotor or the uh, uh, armature going in the opposite direction, uh, propelled by a power in the center, such as a battery uh, of a type which we're not familiar with. Uh, <clears throat> they told me that when these two counter-rotating sources revolve uh, to a speed relative to the Earth as it turns in its axis in relation to its mass that it becomes weightless due to the fact that the electromagnetic lines of force thrown off by the craft repel the magnetic lines of force that the Earth creates and thus uh, propel it away from the Earth's surface. Now by reverse polarity uh, this can be made to attract and uh, thus pull back toward the planet again. By neutralizing this effect uh, between the attraction and the repelling force, this is how they are known to hover in one spot. Do you have any uh, physical evidence of your space contact? Uh, yes, <clears throat> a crystal stone was presented to me uh, as a keepsake or a memento, and uh, I have had this little stone to Germany with me in 1960 when I went over there after this contact. <clears throat> it has been analyzed 
uh, by spectrographic analysis and uh, the experts from Heidelberg University claim that there are properties to be found in the stone that are not to be found on this earth. Since man's first giant leap into space, countless industries have led the way into yet unexplored fields of aerospace sciences and space medicine. New techniques have kept pace with inventions as man seeks methods to develop machines capable of carrying humans into the far reaches of space. Mr. Sherbin, would you please explain how your model corresponds to UFO propulsion systems and how it ties in with the reported rapid and erratic movements of flying saucers? Yes, this model relates to flying saucers in three ways. This basically is taken from what they call planetary motion and flying saucers also duplicate planetary motion. Now, planetary motion of a flying saucer, or this arc, is that flying saucers rotate, they oscillate, and they pendulate. Our vehicles that go into space do not duplicate planetary motion. They duplicate motion that came from the flight of birds. One would be linear, and the other is a cyclical geometry. This has to do with the rotation of the Earth. This is a daily cycle. Its orbit around the sun is a yearly cycle. And what they call the roll is a season or reverses of precession. And this duplicates flying saucers. It also con upsets our concept of gravitational forces because this is a pendulous force that overcomes what we consider inertial force and reverses rotation in violation to our laws of motion. And science cannot explain this because science has never proven its laws of motion. And this is a definite violation of the laws. How does this apply to Einstein's theory of relativity? Einstein's general theory of relativity is not really true. This, this is the model of relativity. It's of cyclical relativity and I have a physical model Einstein's special relativity is based upon the equivalence of gravitational and inertia mass. Both inertia and gravitational forces have never been proven by physical experiment. Einstein merely had an idealized experiment where the experiment is imagined and the results are imagined. He has no foundation whatsoever for his relativity. This does have a foundation for relativity in that you have the rotation of the Earth, you have the pitching, which is its orbit around the Sun, and precession, which is our reference in the galaxial system. So here you have a celestial frame of reference, and Einstein has nothing at all whatsoever. And here you have gravitational forces here, which will come what they overcome what they call inertia forces, which definitely disproves Einstein's general relativity. Here's a model of cyclic relativity disproving general relativity. How did you arrive at the particular shape and measurement for your arc? And how does this configuration relate to motion sickness as we know it? These were taken from the dimensions that God gave to Noah from the book of Genesis. It states an ark, and Moses was placed in an ark of bulrushes. It gives the length, the width, the height, and the camber. Thou shalt finish it a cubit above. Uh, by building this shape of an ark this shape, it is actually a mathematically perfect boat because it's taken from arcs, which an arc is the most perfect of all created forms. Now this particular shape, all the forces in the ocean are compressive strength. So being a spheroid, it's the strongest uncompressive strength. 
It's the strongest on both cantilever and truss stresses. And this boat does not broach two. It quarters lines of force. But one of the most remarkable things about it is that there is no motion sickness. And this is what happens. What gets you motion sickness is the liquid in your ear slopping back and forth. Now, this has what I call double pendulum stability. This is like a compass being placed in quadrants. So when this is in the ocean, the ocean can move around it, and the boat will always remain perfectly stable, where any other type of boat will broach to in the seas and start rolling and get you sick. So this boat, if you're going to put a large amount of uh, passengers in it to withstand the storm, this is the shape that I would use and it would also be a perfect survival craft in a form of kayak today. Say we had an atomic blast and you had to get out of the cities, this is the shape I would use. And since it also duplicates the planetary motion of flying saucers, and there's no motion sickness, they must be able to transport themselves through space and just make any type of move they want, but they would feel no motion whatsoever inside. But they must be highly advanced on this type of geometry. Dr. Ilan Neve explains the method of photographing energy from objects and the human body through Karelian photography. Karelian photography, or the way I prefer to call it aura photography, basically registers on film the energy emanation from an object and very often the way it is used, uh, the energy emanation from the human body, most often from the fingers because this is one of the easiest things to shoot. Um, may I ask uh, exactly uh, how you interpret the colors uh, that you get from these fantastic photographs you take? This is a, a typical question from a Western mind, exactly. I am afraid I couldn't give you an exact answer because this is still not an exact science, although some scientists attempt to make it an exact science. Colors can be interpreted in different ways depending on the person, depending on the interpreter, and depending on the intensity and the quality of the color. So there is no scientific chart by which everybody can go and say, well, that means that you are sick, that means that you are angry, that means that you are well. But there are some standards, some guidelines. For example, certain type of reds may indicate anger. Certain type of red may, uh, and pink even, may indicate a problem blue and white usually manifest calmness. The, uh, the problem with the uh, question that require exactness is that this type of things are not always exact and they are not scientific, although some uh, Kirlian photographers try to make it scientific because colors can be interpreted in different ways. There are different methods of interpreting them and in the final analysis, it depends on the quality of that particular color and on the interpretation and on the subject. For example, red can be interpreted sometimes as anger, as release of some negative qualities, even as disease. But some type of red under certain circumstances may indicate sexual arousement and possibly a positive uh, flow of energy and vitality. As a rule, however, colors such as blue and white are considered very positive. They are spiritual colors, they are colors of healing, they are colors of enlightenment. Dr. Neve, um, in these colors and everything, does this explain uh, some sort of radiation or force that could be uh, connected with UFOs in any way? Yes. Uh, those people who work with Korean photography, quote unquote, scientifically, usually would use slides, and the slides would focus mainly on the corona, the emanation from the fingers, and they, I don't think they would dare making any connections. However, for that reason, I, being a parapsychologist and a metaphysician, I use Polaroid pictures because they are rather sensitive, and you can photograph more than one finger at the same time, and the background that appears on those photographs seems to give me as much and more information than the mere emanation of energy like halo like uh, or rings of energy that come out typically from fingers on Korean photography 
So I would say yes, uh, metaphysically speaking. We have some very interesting, uh, some people call it weird experiences, where we actually get faces on film while all you expose were fingers. And uh, in fact, we had uh, cases where students focused on trying to bring to them a guide. And as you know, a guide can be a spiritual guide. It can be actually a being from a different planet that is guiding, overshadowing this earth. And actually faces, recognizable faces would appear. Sometimes we had even more uh, strange experience where faces that were similar to the person of photograph appeared, which may establish some kinship. In other words, I believe that there are two basic types of aliens, of people from another place on this earth. Some of them are people or rather beings that know, they had the experience, the knowledge, the memory of coming in, let's say, with a spaceship and landing on earth. But more often, these are people who were born, like you and me, from a father and mother, human father and mother, and their being alien manifests in terms of an energy inside a human body. All right, that's all. Now, pull your hand out now, and close it so light doesn't come in. And here's your picture. It is developing right now, okay? It's going to get darker and darker. And while it is getting darker, I would like you to think about that question, about that problem that you had while I was shooting it. Because even now, you are affecting the changes because this is sensitive. There is a chemical change going on and your, the energy that comes from your mind in form of thoughts and expectation does affect it right now. And I want you to be in touch with what you feel because this is just like dream interpretation. I don't right away take a, a book and says, well, water means life and the fire means love, whatever. I first of all find what it means to you individually. So get in touch with any kind of association, even if you think that it, it makes no sense. Now I'm checking now briefly with this psychic responder, the energy flow from your chakras or your psychic centers. So this is the crown chakra. This is where you would usually get your communications from different dimensions, you know, like through your dreams or with being from outer space if they did not come to you in a physical form. Now think right now for a moment about the problem that you we're thinking about before. Now immediately it is start changing into negative. You see now think again, think now about the positive, about the solution of this problem. Now, honestly, I'm not doing anything consciously to it. You see, it is turning now positive. So you see you can actually affect yourself. Now this will check your communications. Oh, this is one of your most powerful ones. And this is, of course, very important chakras. If you are open up here and you are open down here, this, this, is very, this makes you more ready for such communication with being from different dimension. Uh, I'm going to play you a healing music from the Holy Land. The first part has a tear to it. Let that tear flow through your entire being and wash gently but effectively the causes of all pain, all constrictions, all barriers to communication and make room for the second part that has a dance to it and let that dance create celestial rhythm. And this celestial rhythm will create, create harmony from within yourself. So just all you have to do is just to listen to this and just relax.
great life force uh, flow through every atom in your body, through every subatom, through every process or probability of processes known or unknown to you or to science, and bring everything within you, in all dimensions and in all levels, into harmony so that the guidance can flow through you, so that you can get in touch with everything. And so it is. And when you're ready, you open your eyes and be wide awake, feeling and being perfectly well and perfectly one with all. Dr. King, can you tell us something about ancient civilizations on Earth and their relationship, if any, to UFOs and space beings? Uh, yes, there were ancient civilizations uh, in chronological order. Uh, uh, Lemuria came first, and uh, some people believe that this was uh, mainly uh, uh, it, where the Pacific Ocean is now, and uh, mankind reach, uh, reached quite a high stage of evolution in Lemuria, uh, so high, in fact, that he discovered uh, how to split the atom and uh, of course mankind being what he is a very warlike creature um, well the result was the destruction of Lemuria and also the uh, earth at that time did flip uh, a few degrees on its axis um, later on we had another civilization uh, built up again from the atomic ruins of the last, and that was Atlantis. Now, it's interesting uh, thing about Atlantis is this, that at one time, uh, science uh, can prove that the whole of Europe was covered with uh, deep snow and ice. And some catastrophe happened very quickly, uh, which altered the course of the Gulf Stream so that it flowed uh, nearer to the coast of Europe and up through and actually near the tip of the uh, north of Scotland. Uh, some people believe that this was a part of the uh, continent of Atlantis going down. Uh, two of the most ancient books on Earth are now translated from the Sanskrit uh, into English. Uh, and they do talk about Vimanas, which were, were flying machines, and they do talk about two atomic weapons that were used. One, uh, the Brahma weapon, uh, and the other called Indra's dart. Uh, there was an atomic war, and the result of this atomic war was the destruction of Atlantis. Uh, again, it's very interesting to note that uh, people are now uh, are making uh, quite some discoveries uh, in this regard. For instance, they found a huge road about a hundred foot beneath sea level. Uh, this road is made of very, very large stones which do not belong in that area, and these stones are fit very, very closely together. Uh, the stones, they estimate, weigh hundreds of tons each, and it's possible that the uh, Atlanteans had powers uh, which we do not have today. Dr. King expounds on types of UFOs and their propulsion systems. We have the large mother craft. Uh, these can be tremendous size. Uh, they have a capability of, um, shall we say, tuning into uh, natural magnetic forces which do flow very fr freely through this galaxy and uh, transferring that into kinetic energy. The usual type of scout patrol vessel, uh, like uh, the, that in this little uh, model here, which by the way is made exactly to scale. This is a model of a scout patrol vessel, which is uh, about 32 and a half feet in diameter. Now, uh, this uh, uh, vessel here has three uh, propulsion units. One I won't mention at this time, it's too complex. Uh, the other, again, it's capable of tuning into the uh, natural flow of forces throughout the universe. But the third one is very interesting. Uh, as these vehicles operate for the most part uh, quite near to a planetary mass, 
such as Earth or another planet, they're able to reverse the flow of gravity. Uh, the space people know, by the way, that gravity has two poles, rather like a magnet. A uh, magnet has a north and a south pole. Gravity has a positive and negative pole. And they're able to reverse the flow of this gravity so that a planetary mass can repel the vehicle or attract it. Uh, this is uh, often the reason why some scout patrol vessels fly in a rather, uh, shall we say, um, uh, erratic uh, manner. This is an artist's impression of the third satellite. On the top, there is a huge crystalline dome for collecting the sun's energies. At the bottom, there's a power matrix for transmitting the sun's energies after they have been conditioned by the enormous crystals within the craft. This next drawing gives you a rough idea of the position of the third satellite. You see the impression of the sun, the energies being collected by the dome at the top and transmitted to Earth through the power matrix at the bottom. Dr. King explains the universe's dependence on the sun, not only for energy, but for its material existence. All life uh, uh, in this solar system, and we are told in other solar systems too, is dependent upon either this sun or their respective suns, whichever it might be. You know, uh, the sun is very, very important indeed uh, to us, far, far more important than people realize. Uh, the master of Theorius has made this statement, which science will not understand for the next thousand years, but he has said, uh, talking about the physical aspects of man, you are all solidified sunlight. UFOs have been sighted over every nation in the world, reports Dr. Frank Strangis. The National Investigations Committee is a group of individuals throughout the world that's solely dedicated to scientific research, evaluation, and investigation of UFOs, and it's also open to the public. I would say in my 32 or 33 years of UFO investigation, I have found definite evidence of a conspiracy. When we speak of the word conspiracy, it's a group of individuals who gather together with a prime purpose of either doing good or evil to a subject or, an, or another. As far as UFO conspiracy is concerned, yes, there are forces at work to squelch all valid UFO material. The United Nations has gone on record as saying that they would favor open hearings, open investigation, but uh, the first nation to object was the United States, and this is rather comical. However, the United States Air Force still contends that UFOs do not pose any threat against the security of the United States, nor does it represent any at more advanced technology other than we can meet. Robert Short, founder of the Blue Rose Ministry in Yucca Valley, California. I believe that they want us to understand that basically, coming right down to it, we really are one race of people, united under one supreme being or created life. They call ageless life, almighty God, father of lights. And uh, that we, as the children of the supreme creator, um, have our decisions to make insofar as trying, if we can, to put forth the willingness to achieve peace in our time, rather than bringing us to the brink of what we call an Armageddon. And uh, so far as I know now, the peace efforts, even though continue to be tried, is like the old axiom, when they cry, peace and safety, there will be none. We are headed for the final countdown, unfortunately.
The producers wish to acknowledge with profound thanks the cooperation of the following people without whose help this film could not have been made. Jim Frazier, Dr. George King, Dr. Frank E. Strangis, Ruth Norman, Reverend Robert Short, Dr. Elon Neve, Brian Scott, Gabriel Green, Dan Fry, Thomas Miller, Mr. Schaufler, Mr. Armin, Alan Michael, Carl Anderson, Timothy Shanks, Charles Sherburn, Sarah Nickerson, William Young, and Steve Shuttack.